ladies and gentlemen, uh, our president, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Professor Julie Hoffman from the French National Academy of Sciences. He is the president since 2007. Okay. It's really uh, my honor to introduce him. He was born in Luxembourg, Luxembourg, okay, and he received his uh, uh, PhD degree in biology in 1969 in University of Strasbourg, France. Strasbourg is a very beautiful uh, university town in the eastern north of France. Let me use a little bit Chinese, okay. There are wars between uh, France and Germany, so they fight each other. So this town sometimes belongs to France, sometimes to Germany, okay. It's a very beautiful place. If you've never been there, you should go there and stay for a while, okay? There is a so-called small Paris a town and a, such a beautiful place. You would never uh, imagine how beautiful that would be. Another thing is uh, I saw many beautiful ladies and young, young gentlemen there, okay? I was curious, you know, how could be people are so handsome and beautiful? So in the morning, I took the bus, circled the, the town, right? And I saw those... Uh, Kids, students, they go to school. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Nine of the ten people are handsome and beautiful. The other one is me. Okay. <laughs> so you, you, you have to go to Strasbourg. Okay. And in 1993, up to now, Professor uh, Hoffman uh, was the so called distinguished class of research director of CNRS. Okay. He's an institute of about 200 people but one third uh, under his uh, research guidance. So you know, he has very big research group. He published uh, more than 250 papers, six books, and has been awarded many, many awards. I don't remember all of those, just name a couple in here. He received William Corey Award, uh, Robert Koch Prize, Bazen Prize, and uh, etc. Okay, and also he has been academy members in many countries, United States, Russia, French, uh, France of course, Germany, Europe. Okay, so he's a highly regarded uh, scholar, and uh, today he's going to give a, a wonderful talk. Although I don't know the topic very well. Okay, I'm a biochemist, not re really biologist, but he is a internationally regarded uh, scholar in. Uh, biology. Today he is going to talk about uh, uh, microbiochemism uh, defense host system. Okay, let's uh, welcome Professor Hoffman. Okay. Ready? Thank you very much for this warm introduction. And let me confirm that there are many good-looking gentlemen and uh, young ladies in Strasbourg. And we really have money to accept doctoral and postdoctoral students. So if ever you want to come and see them, <laughs> you'd be very welcome to. I think you can hear me without this, or can you? Maybe I don't need it. Then. OK. Uh, we'll see how it's, this goes. So um, first of all, I thank. Uh, everyone for this uh, very kind invitation and I'm uh, very happy to be with you and to explain to you what we have learned over the last 15 years or so since we got involved in the immune defense of Drosophila. And um, before I start, uh, we start at 3 o'clock, now it's 20 past 3. Yeah, Just well, tell me, I uh, can speak until... So, um, no, it's better with this after all. Um, so I will not go into too many details. I would just like to give you a sort of a feeling of the field to attract you possibly to the field after what has been said about Strasbourg University and this town and to, to tell you the story, how things developed. So um, with this, I always uh, love to start with this slide because my father who was a professor of zoology in Luxembourg has drawn this slide. And this is an insect showing that it can be attacked by uh, various um, 
pathogens, which can be fungi, bacteria, viruses, and uh, even uh, protozoa. So uh, we got, for various reasons, which I'm not going, to in, uh, not going to detail now, we got interested in this in the early 90s. And at that time, it was well established that insects had a multifaceted system of defense. That is to say, phagocytosis, uh, which uh, you're familiar with, and then induction of antimicrobial peptides and uh, various types of production of uh, uh, proteolytic cascades, which I'm not going to detail, and NO, and so on. The main thrust, as we have learned, the main defense is phagocytosis by blood cells, as we do have it, and the induction of the antimicrobial peptides. Now, how did we come to this? So we decided uh, at that time that we would take Drosophila uh, as a model system, and we were, I would say, without... Uh, some uh, self-consideration. We were the first to attack this system, which was already known to be extremely efficient in terms of genetics, manipulating the genetics. But it was a very small insect, and people were afraid that you could not really find uh, uh, the mechanisms uh, uh, because uh, it was just not enough blood and so on. Okay, we overcame this, thanks to the help of very competent um, biochemists and physical chemists in Strasbourg. And uh, so what is shown in this first slide, this first uh, data slide, is that when you prick a fly at time zero, uh, as uh, you see here, and then take uh, the blood over a certain number of hours, you see that in the cell-free hemolymph, so we are not considering here phagocytosis, you see the appearance of a strong, a powerful antimicrobial activity. So it is, the important words here, is an inducible process, and it is antimicrobial. Now, we, asked, we set out to ask three questions. Number one, what is the identity of the molecules which account for this inducible antimicrobial activity? Number two, when we found that they were essentially, uh, I'm sorry, when they, they were essentially, that I cannot read, but someone can. Uh, yes, but uh, it's, I'm always at lunch and dinner in this country, so <laughs> no, 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 that's not the right direction. So that, uh, yes, yeah, okay. So the second question, which has disappeared, was once we saw that uh, we noticed there they were uh, peptides, how are the genes controlling these peptides turned on? And the third question then was, how does the insect realize that there is an infection and can it discriminate between various types of infections? So, uh, first question, I'll make a long story short and say that we found over the years that the fat body cells, which is the equivalent of our liver, produces, in response to infection, seven distinct families, the families of antimicrobial peptides, which we identified. Uh, one of the most interesting is here, drosomycin, uh, which is, uh, we call it drosomycin because it's antifungal. Uh, it's a very complex uh, 3D structure with four disulfide bridges. Then a, a peptide, which we called Mechikovin, because the postdoc who found it in the laboratory was from Russia. Mechnikovin. Then uh, also antifungal, defensin turned out to be anti-gram positive, and the other four are active against gram negatives, namely diptericin, to which I'll come back in a moment, drososin, which is heavily glycosylated, and atacin and cecropin, which are homologous to molecules which were initially identified in the cecropia moth by Hans Bohmann in Stockholm in the early 80s. The important uh, point is that they are uh, the control of, is at a level of expression of transcription. They are then matured, they are prepropeptides, matured and secreted into the blood where the combined concentrations are around 400 micromolar. Those peptides are extremely active but require relatively high concentrations. Diptericin can kill a gram-negative bacteria in a matter of two to three seconds. But we calculated that it takes a million of these molecules to kill the bacteria. Now, this level of concentration is present in the fly, in the blood of the fly, but it is a drawback if you want to develop uh, these molecules for human therapy. The drawback is that the concentrations are relatively high, so in the 10 to the minus 6 molar. Okay, this is uh, the answer to the first question. Let me now turn to the second question. How are the molecules... Uh, uh, these peptides, how the peptides, uh, how the genes encoding these peptides turned on during the infection. And here we were, um, let me just uh, pause a second here and uh, show 
this picture, this was a conference uh, which I had organized with Charlie Janeway in Versailles. This was, probably was the first meeting on innate immunity, international meeting on innate immunity, devoted to innate immunity. And just to take home message of this picture is that here we have uh, persons like Michael Sarsloff, Bob Lehrer, who had found, identified antimicrobial peptides in uh, vertebrates, Hans Bohmann, whose name I've already mentioned, in the Cecropia moth, and uh, who came together at this meeting with persons who were interested more in the recognition process and in the control of uh, the expression of the genes. And we had, for, at that time, Charlie Janeway and myself, uh, with Sunji Natori and Alan Zikovitz, who is, Alan Zikovitz is here. We had developed a, a common program, a human frontiers pro, uh, science program on uh, understanding how uh, recognition could occur in uh, this system. Now, uh, we were helped in the fly, and that's why uh, things went a little bit uh, more quickly in the fly than in the other systems, by the fact that we discovered rapidly that in the gene, in the promoter sequences of the gene encoding of, excuse me, of the gene, yes, encoding uh, uh, diptericin, which is, was the first peptide which we had cloned, there were two sequence elements which were similar to kappa B response elements. Now, uh, at that time, kappa B response elements, I'll explain what this is. At that time, it had been shown or initial work by David Baltimore, starting in 86, had shown that a central transactivator was responsible for controlling the expression of many immune response genes or stress response genes. They called this NF-kappa B because uh, they had identified it initially in B cells, in mammalian B lymphocytes, uh, in the promoter uh, of the genes encoding the kappa B light chains. And this was in a lymphoma cell. A line. And um, so NF stands for nuclear factor. That was all uh, basically uh, most of what was known at that time. So uh, let me just show uh, in this slide that what you can do in the fly easily, which uh, makes in vivo, not in a cell line, but in vivo makes the approach uh, very credible, is that you can establish a transgenic fly line, which is a reporter line, so we replaced the coding sequence by a galactosizase, and then we took uh, this fly, this is transgenic fly, in which we have wild type uh, response elements. Now, if we challenge this fly now uh, with, um, with uh, bacteria or fungi, we see the appearance in all the fat body cells around the body of the reporter gene. So in other words, we have here a system which allows us to uh, to analyze in detail the uh, promoter sequences, what we did then, and we mutated the sequences, and the result was that, yes, these kappa B response elements are mandatory, they are necessary for the induction of uh, the system. So starting from there, we went to, uh, to ask, what is known, what do we know about NF-kappa B family members in the fly? And let me just, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with NF-kappa B, the central transactivator, show in this slide. At that time, as I mentioned in a second, there was one known in the fly which went by the name of dorsal, and in mammals, as P65, uh, came to be known, was known in, actually at this time already. And they have in common uh, a rel homology domain, which allows binding to the DNA, dimerization, and a transactivation domain, which will allow for transactivation. Now, the important point to keep in mind is that this transactivator, this potent transactivator, is present in the cytoplasm and cannot activate gene transcription because it is bound to uh, an inhibitor protein, which is marked here as I kappa B, or in the fly will be cactus, as we'll see in a moment. So this binds uh, to the transactivator, which remains silent. And the whole play of the insect or of our cells will be to try to take this away in a signal dependent uh, manner so as to uh, set free NF-kappa B which then will translocate into the nucleus and be able to, um, to direct the transcription of uh, the responsive genes. I'm going to skip this because I don't want to... Yeah, so now what we... So let's again very simply put the situation. What do we know? 92, 93. We know that there are uh, inducible antimicrobial peptides, which are an essential response of the fly to infection. 
Number two, we know that for uh, transcription of these trans genes to occur, we need a central transactivator, which is of the general nf kappa -B family present in humans as well as in flies, as we know now. And this transactivator does not transactivate because it's blocked in the cytoplasm by binding to an inhi inhibitor. Okay, now, uh, what uh, was known in a totally independent approach by Nobel laureate Nislein Vollhardt and Erich Wieschaus, they had worked on early embryonic development in the fly, on dorsal ventral patterning, and they had found a series of what they had done. They had taken female flies and uh, fed them on uh, a carcinogen, a mutagen, and uh, they induced a certain number of mutant, of lethal mutant, embryos, embryos which died, did not develop, and they had strange phenotypes, and all the names come from those phenotypes. A dorsal, for instance, is a phenotype of a fly, uh, which is only dorsal, has no uh, belly. And uh, so, and cactus has bristles all around. So they had shown that there was a cascade of genes, of maternally expressed genes, which controls uh, cactus and dorsal in the cytoplasm, and this control is exerted when um, a cascade of several genes becomes activated and essentially there is a gene which uh, they called the tall gene, again because of the phenotype. The phenotype was funny. Uh, basically tall means funny in German. So uh, there was a signal from this transmembrane receptor required for cactus, we now know to become phosphorylated, to dissociate from dorsal and to allow dorsal to go into the nucleus to control transactivation of the genes, encoding, now this is in the early embryonic system, encoding genes required for segmentation and so on for uh, early embryonic development. So again, what uh, these uh, studies have shown is that TOL itself becomes activated by binding to a cleaved form of what we will, uh, for the sake of time, consider as a cytokine, a signal molecule. All this is the perivital in space, and this needs a complex cascade of proteases. So far, so good. So what we uh, then decided to do is to look if those genes which were reported as maternally expressed genes were possibly also later uh, expressed in larval or adult development in adult males, for instance, and the answer was yes. And in addition, they were strongly noticed that they were strongly upregulated during immune challenge, which uh, suggested that they were really involved in this. Now, what we next did is taking the mutants which were available and looking in adult flies, essentially in males, which do not express those genes in the ovaries in contrast to the females. Remember, those are maternally expressed genes. So we looked at uh, adult male flies and we uh, checked for the expression of those antimicrobial uh, genes in response to an immune challenge. So what you see here is this is a northern blot of uh, the level of uh, RNA expression. This is the loading control. And what we saw is that drosomycin, remember the complex anti antifungal peptide, is induced as the anti-gram negative peptide diptericin uh, in wild type flies in response to a challenge after six hours here, which was expected, which we hoped would be the case. Now, when we looked at the total deficient background, the information was clear. There was, in contra there was no expression in this context of drosomycin. So the theory, or our hypothesis, uh, appeared to be correct at least partially in this case, but to our surprise we saw that diptericin was still fully inducible, which led us to propose then that there were probably two, uh, uh, this, excuse me, and then uh, just by chance, uh, serendipity at that time, we had a, a fly line in the laboratory which we refer to as IMD, and as shown in this uh, part of the slide, the phenotype here is converse. That is to say, in the IMD background, uh, drosomycin remains fully inducible, whereas diptericin is not induced anymore. So this, these data then uh, pr uh, led us to propose that, in fact, the expression of the antimicrobial peptides was controlled by two pathways. One which was, as we know uh, now, a partial reuse of the embryonic regulatory cascade toll pathway, and another one which we propose to, uh, to refer to as IMD on the sole basis 
admittedly, of having a mutant fly in uh, our hands. So much of the work which followed uh, has been devoted to the analysis of those two pathways to their control. But before going the, uh, into the detail of that, let me just pause a second and uh, say and address the question why this was so important. Again, I uh, refer to the collaboration which we had with Charlie Janeway and Alan Likovitz and, uh, who are from the medical field and the, the question came up, is what you propose here, two pathways, is this relevant in, uh, during a normal life uh, of an infected fly? That is to say, uh, if you take off, if you block one or both pathways, how does this translate into resistance to uh, pathogens? And this is shown in the next two slides. Here is an infection by E. coli. In a wild-type fly, you see there's a very little, very little effect. And this is survival in the IMD mutant background. Now remember, uh, the IMD pathway is the second pathway uh, of which we at that time only knew, only had this mutant in our hands. So clearly, if you have a background of IMD mutation, you have a very apparently compromised effect on survival. Conversely, if you would infect what we did, these flies, the IMD flies with fungi, you would see a phenotype similar to the one which uh, you would have in the wild type. So, uh, in the next slide, uh, what we have done is uh, infecting flies with Aspergillus, and this time we address tall mutant uh, flies, and uh, here we have the survival to, in uh, the wild type flies, and uh, as you see, there is an effect, uh, and in the end, over a period of uh, 10 or 12 days, the flies will die off, but in a tall deficient background, the effect is extremely uh, marked. Uh, after, after three days, uh, there is no survival. And this uh, was illustrated in this uh, fly, in this slide, where you have a fly which is a tall deficient fly, which is here owned by the fungal hyphae. So, now the question, why was this so uh, relevant at that time? Why did this draw such attention? This fly made the cover of Cell in 96, and uh, sort of a new era started in uh, innate immunology, and uh, let me just explain why. So, uh, f this is a simple slide of phylogeny of host defenses. So, you have innate immunity present in all the uh, groups up to the agnathans, and then appeared in, uh, probably in what we refer to as the now extinct placoderms, uh, you have the appearance of adaptive immunity. It's a sort of unique process, which is probably explained by the introduction of one or two types of transposon into the genes encoding immunoglobulin uh, type receptors. But the important point is that this occurred in a context of innate immunity, and innate immunity remains the essential first-line response of uh, uh, all these groups here, the rep, uh, from fishes to mammals. They all have an innate immune response, and it is vital for the defense. And uh, I'll mention this in a few moments. There are a certain number of uh, diseases where we now know that this, the effect is in the innate immune uh, response. What is more, it was understood at that time, it was proposed, I would say, by Charlie Janeway, that uh, the uh, innate immune response directed the adaptive immune response, or at least was required for the uh, adaptive immune response. And this is illustrated in this slide. So, uh, for those who are a little bit familiar with uh, adaptive immune responses, we have here uh, T lymphocytes. Uh, I haven't figured here the B lymphocytes, but those lymphocytes, uh, to really uh, go from their naive state to a uh, fully reactive state, need uh, the actions of cytokines, several cytokines, and also uh, the presence of co-stimulatory molecules, which will not go into detail of, the, of this, but uh, will act in uh, uh, association with the uh, MHC complex, which is going to present the peptide. So the, we need a co-stimulation. So what was believed, but not demonstrated, was that all these uh, responses here were under the control of NF-kappa B and dependent on a first stimulus. And this first stimulus was microbes, microbial ligands, but uh, there was no, uh, at that time, uh, no idea was 
uh, available on the nature of this um, of these receptors. Now, remember, those of you, well, I think we all have uh, undergone immunizations or vaccinations, and uh, at that time, uh, at the moment of vaccination, you always have an adjuvant which is injected. Uh, with, the, the most common is BCG, which comes from the Pasteur Institute, Bacille Calmette Guérin, and uh, if you were, for an, uh, yourself, were to produce antibodies against, let me say, ovalbumin, a protein, you would inject the protein, but you would not really get antibodies in your mouth. Uh, or very low title. But to get a good title, you have to add adjuvants. And adjuvants are essentially a mixture of microbial ligands. There's some uh, so microbial ligands. So the question, the open question here was, how are those microbial ligands recognized and activate NF-kappa beta to direct adaptive immune response? So you see, we have two big questions. Number one, how does innate immunity recognize microorganisms? And number two, how upon recognition of uh, these microbial, uh, microbial determinants or ligands or whatever, does it activate the adaptive immune system? Now, uh, you will understand in one moment the interest of the uh, data which we had obtained in the fly. Uh, it was known, this is 95, it was known that uh, lipopolysaccharide can bind to CD14, but it was uh, lipopolysaccharide as the, the essential cover of gram-negative bacteria, but it was not known to which receptor it actively, productively bound. That is to say, bound and induced nf -cap. Now, CD14 has leucine-rich domains in the extracytoplasmic domain, but it is GPI-anchored, which means it cannot signal intracytoplasmically. On the other hand, the structure of the interleukin-1 receptor was known. It's shown here. And uh, the extracytoplasmic domain, which binds the interleukin pro-inflammatory cytokine, is immunoglobulin-like domains. But it is hooked to an intracytoplasmic domain, which activates NF-kappa B. Now, this is a very special... Am I doing this? Yes. It's a very special domain. And now, it's a signaling domain, now look at the structure of toll, and you will understand uh, the interest because here we have an intracytoplasmic signaling domain which is homologous to this domain which had been shown already to activate NF-kappa B, and an extracytoplasmic domain which at least conceptually was evocative of this domain here which had been shown to bind LPS. So in other words, to state it very simply, what this showed is that nature at least in one system, the fly, to defend against one type of microorganism, fungi, has produced a chimera with a recognition domain which potentially can bind to LPS and a signaling domain which can activate NF-kappa B in another system. So this was uh, extremely intellectually, extremely stimulating. And so uh, Charlie Janeway, who uh, had already EST libraries from humans, went with uh, Ruslan Mejitov, they went to look for uh, homologs of the toll um, and uh, for the, of the fly toll, they found a homolog and uh, one year and a half later they published this paper where they showed that a, homolog, a human homolog of Drosophila toll can signal to the adaptive immune uh, response and uh, one year later Bruce Beutler in the final demonstration showed that there was a mutant fly, uh, excuse me, a mutant mouse around uh, which was mutant for uh, the reaction to LPS. So it was called the LPS mutant mouse. It was unable to respond to LPS and nor, nor to gram-negative infection. And when uh, Bruce cloned this, uh, he, uh, he found that it was a toll-like receptor. This was the name was then coined at that time, toll-like receptor, receptor like the Drosophila toll, and that it was the, uh, the uh, receptor for LPS. So lipopolysaccharide of gram-negative. So, so uh, this led then over the years uh, to uh, this uh, uh, concluding slide in which we now know we have, uh, we humans have 11 toll-like receptors and uh, they have this signaling domain, intracytoplasmic signaling domain, which I've uh, shown in one of the preceding slides. They have extracytoplasmic leucine-rich domains. All this has now been worked out in detail. Those domains have been crystallized. 
But an important point, which as we will see is distinct from that of the fly, they do recognize uh, LPS, for instance, in this case. Uh, they do recognize microbial ligands directly, lipopeptides, bacterial lipoflagellin, uh, or those are in the cytoplasmic membrane, or in the next slide, on the endosome compartment, you have other TLRs, free actually, which uh, bind to nucleotides, double-stranded, single-stranded, and so on, or to CPG DNA. Those will uh, help fight against uh, viral infection in this case, or against some other bacterial infection in this case. And uh, what we also know now is that through various adapter proteins, uh, namely MIT-88, which we find in the fly, uh, they do activate uh, two essential transactivators. One is NF-kappa-B, which we have mentioned already. The other is the interferon regulatory factor, which is absent from invertebrates and absent from the fly. So for NF-kappa-B and activated immune response. So, this is sort of a summary of that part of uh, the exciting period uh, and the collaboration which we had between mice and flies, and uh, which went to humans. And uh, let me just uh, uh, finish on that by saying that uh, uh, we know the, now that the importance of the TLRs is extreme. When we published the paper on the role of toll in '96 in the immune response, it was the first paper uh, clearly mentioning that toll could be involved in the immune response. Uh, last year, there were up to 6,000 papers on TLRs. Uh, so it has become one of the most moving fields. And in particular, uh, we now know that a certain number of human diseases, of monogenic human diseases, where children which are extremely prone to uh, recurrent pyogenic infections have uh, mutations in their own genes and coding uh, either one of the TLRs or downstream signaling molecules of the TLR system. So this is of uh, direct uh, importance to, uh, to, to humans, to our own resistance, and we now know through a lot of work which has been going on uh, over the, all the continents, we now know that also a juvency, is made, a juvency that is to say uh, strong, a powerful induction of the adaptive immune response is mediated via the TLR system. Let me now turn uh, to the signaling pathways in the fly. So we have made the point that there's a tall pathway and an IMD pathway. These pathways have been worked out in detail. It's probably not relevant for us this afternoon that we go into the detail of this. Again, let me mention, as uh, I have done already uh, here in Taiwan, uh, we have, our group has written two, uh, ex two uh, complete reviews on this uh, very recently, and they're very easy to find on, if you look up uh, PubMed, uh, and one is an annual review of uh, immunology, and that's about 40 pages, and the other one is in Nature Review Immunology, and find uh, most of the slides which I'm showing you if ever you're interested in it. But you're of course very welcome to send me an email and to ask for further details and so on. Now, uh, I will nevertheless, I've opted to show quickly to you the signaling pathways as we understand them now. But don't try to memorize uh, the system. I have three slides and one take home message. Just be prepared for the take home message. So, uh, quickly then, here, uh, what we have is uh, a Spätzle, as I mentioned, uh, the, the cleaved form of the cytokine Spätzle. Forget the name. The name is inappropriate, doesn't help. It was uh, Nusslein Follat who coined it. So, this uh, cleaved cytokine interacts with the toll receptor and then uh, activates uh, several uh, members of the receptor adapter complex, including a kinase, which goes by the name of Pella, referring to the phenotype of the mutant embryo, and then through a process which here is not fully understood, uh, goes to, leads to the phosphorylation of cactus, which dissociates from this uh, NF-kappa-B complex, which is shown here as a dimer, which goes into the nucleus and will then activate the transcription of drosomycin and additional uh, genes. And uh, during this process, uh, following this process then, uh, cactus is degraded in the proteasome. So this is the way the control of the transcription uh, goes as we understand it. It's, uh, of course, uh, more complex, but that's not relevant for this afternoon. And um, now, uh, 
this was this was a problem for us when we did, when we were sure to establish this because the initial idea between uh, our collaborators and ourselves was that uh, after all in the uh, immune system maybe toll could um, respond to a microbial ligand all the more so i think that's the next detail yes all the more so as drosophila has eight additional toll receptors so as the works develop between our colleagues uh, at Yale and Harvard, uh, with whom we collaborated. By that time, uh, we had a major NIH grant together. As the work developed, the idea came up that probably in the fly, as in mice, those various receptors would recognize various lig microbial ligands. And the essential microbial ligands would be lipopolysaccharide for gram-negatives, peptidoglycan for all the bacteria, glucans for the fungi, and so on. This, as I've shown now, the case which proved to be the case in the mammalian system. So why in the fly would we also have, why would we not have a, a similar system? Well, we do not, or at least the fly does not. So which then asks the question, what are the microbial sensors for the infection? And to that I will come back in a few minutes. Now, uh, with this in mind, so we could prove very definitely that it was Spetzer which bound to this and not a microbial ligand. And so we had this left us then with the question, what is really going on upstream? But before I go to that, let me just go to the second pathway, the IMD pathway, which turned out to be much more complex than we had anticipated. So here we do have a transmembrane receptor which binds to a gram-negative bacteria. It binds to a peptidoglycan of gram-negative bacteria and to which I'll come back in just a second. Now here the system proved very complex. We have first of all the IMD molecule, which is shown here. And uh, when we cloned uh, the MD gene in 2000, it turned out that it was a molecule with a DEF domain. And this DEF domain, to our utter surprise, was closest to that of, of mammalian rib. And mammalian rib is a co -adapt It's an adapter of the TNF receptor. Now, TNF, you may be aware of that, is one of the major pro-inflammatory cytokines in humans. Plays an important role in defense and in inflammation. Now, the system uh, goes further on. Downstream of this, we have a MAP-free kinase, essential MAP-free kinase, which goes by the name of TEC1. And uh, so there is phosphorylation of TEC1. And downstream of this, uh, we have uh, phosphorylation of a complex, which goes by the name of signalosome. As I promised, I'll be quick on that. Uh, uh, unless you're familiar with signaling pathways, this is not very meaningful. Only the outcome is meaningful, and that is to say that uh, the nf kappa b family member, which goes in this particular case by the name of relish, becomes phosphorylated and then cleaved. Now, the interesting point is that it becomes cleaved by a caspase, which is shown here. In Drosophila, it has the, again, the phenotype name DREAD, but in fact, this is a homologue of mammalian caspase 8, of our own caspase 8. The result of this being that we have uh, uh, this cactus part goes away and uh, on the other hand we have the active part which is this part here goes into the nucleus where it uh, controls expression of diptericin which I've mentioned the gram negative and hundreds of other, other genes. It's a little bit, it's much more complex but uh, just to put, uh, put out that this MAP kinase also acts on the Jun kinase pathway which is a pathway controlling cytoskeletal protein expression. And um, in addition, I should make this point here that if you overexpress some of these molecules here, you will induce apoptosis of the cells. So, um, why do I give all these details, um, which I just ask you to forget immediately? I want to give them because in the next slide, so just to try to take a picture, an intellectual picture in your brain of this without looking at the names. And now I go to the next slide, and this is nf kappa b activation by TNF in mammals. I'm not going into detail this, but you see immediately that it's extremely similar. Just for the fun of it, we have here the equivalent of mammalian IMD. We have here, of, uh, excuse me, Drosophila IMD, as I've mentioned. We have here TAC1, which I mentioned to play a big role. It's a MAP-free kinase in the Drosophila system. 
We have uh, activation of the June kinase pathway. We have, which is not shown here, caspase 8, the equivalent of, uh, uh, the, equivalent of um, uh, the DRED protein. We have the IKK complex. So we have, as in the fly, this uh, TAG1 MAP-free kinase phosphorylates the IKK complex, phosphorylates the system, the uh, June kinase pathway, and so on. So take home message. That's all I want you to uh, take in, <laughs> to take home, if possible this afternoon, is when we look at this system, we see that there's an extreme similarity between what the fly has developed hundreds of millions of years ago. Because, you know, um, humans, if I may say so, Homo sapiens, appeared only 200,000 years ago. And uh, uh, the fly appeared millions of millions of years ago. And so this system uh, equivalent, roughly, with the same modules in the same order and in the same direction uh, to fight infection. So uh, with this said, let me uh, turn rapidly to um, the, um, to the uh, third question which we had asked, and that is how insect action. Again, uh, what, uh, what we have done here was unbiased uh, mutagenesis, feeding the insects with a mutagen and uh, looking for survival, which was the basic approach which we did in our work for survival to fungi, gram-positives, gram-negatives. And here's one example of many studies uh, in which we could show that the survival to the gram-positive Streptococcus faecalis in wild type shown here, and in one mutant which we refer to, as you can choose your name in the system, referred to as Semmelweis, uh, in that system you had, uh, your survival was, or survival of the fly was severely compromised. And when we uh, gram-positive, so this is gram-positive bacteria, gram-negatives, uh, survival was like in wild types and fungi like in wild types. So we had here, that was the first time we had something very uh, specific here uh, in our hands and uh, so uh, that made nature. And uh, so uh, we were trying not to find out what uh, was the molecule uh, which uh, we had affected by the mutagenesis screen. And um, let me be quick on this uh, and just give the take home message again. A very interesting uh, system which nature has developed. Nature has started from a very ancient amidase domain. Amidase is an enzyme. An amidase domain, and that, uh, this domain has now been, uh, the one here which I'm talking about has been crystallized uh, in several laboratories. Here we have this uh, homology domain to which I'll come back with a groove. In this groove, peptidoglycan can be fixed and cleaved by the amidase. And in this case, you diminish, you take away the peptidoglycan, which has entered into the blood of the insect. So it's an anti-immunogenic, so to say. Now, Drosophila has uh, 13 members of this family. We have six. It has been maintained in humans, up to humans. We have six. They also play a role in antimicrobial defenses. Now, everywhere we have put this domain in white, the amylase activity has been conserved. But when it is in blue, there was a change, a mutation, and what has been an active amylase has become a dead amylase, but a it remains a recognition motif for peptidoglycan. And I'll illustrate this in the next slide. This is peptidoglycan. These are the glucan chains up uh, here and there which are linked via stem peptides. This is classical. You find this in any te textbook of biochemistry. Now, the interesting point is, and this is a synthesis, this does not exist, in gram-positive bacteria, you would have a lysine in this position, in gram-negative, a diaminopimetic acid. Now, over the mutations, over history, over evolution, what has happened is that this domain which I showed you, the groove being here, this domain has undergone a certain number of in some species, in some instances, in some genes, has undergone mutations, and this coordinating zinc is not present anymore. 
If everything is like here, you will cleave, your amidase will cleave this. And instead of a peptidoglycan, you will have just irrelevant debris of peptidoglycan. Now, uh, in other instances where the zinc has disappeared because the uh, amino acid acids here coordinating the zinc are not present anymore as a result of a mutation in the gene, you will still bind peptidoglycan, but you will not cleave it. You will have a recognition domain, either in one of the forms for lysine, and you will recognize gram positives, or in another system, and that should appear in the next, yes, for diaminopimetic acid, and then you will recognize uh, gram-negative bacterial infection. And uh, if I were very familiar with the system, I would go back, but uh, go back with me intellectually, and uh, just remember in the preceding slide where we had those 13 distinct peptidoglycan recognition proteins, some of them short in circulation, other transmembrane, uh, all this now allows for a readout for a system which will read out the difference between gram positives and gram negatives or retain the amidase activity. So it's an extremely elegant system which has evolved over hundreds of millions of years and which now allows the insect to recognize peptidoglycan and uh, bacterial infection. Now, uh, I will summarize now this information. And uh, in, the, in this slide, again, it's a simplified slide, but it's uh, enough for what we need this afternoon. So gram-positive bacteria interact with one of those, one of the family members, which then, uh, as you remember, are called peptidoglycan recognition proteins. SA is a sub-number. We can forget about that. As a result, this took really some time to demonstrate. A proteolytic cascade is activated. Those enzymes are now have been uh, identified and mutants exist for all this. Culmination in the cleavage of Spätzle, which interacts with toll and activates the system. Now, uh, fungi interact with another protein, which is not of that family, which is a glucan binding protein. And uh, that has also been crystallized recently. I, I'm not going into detail of that. But in this case, again, a proteolytic cascade is activated, which culminates in the cleavage of Spätzle and activates a toll pathway. Now, another point which I want to make shortly is that recently we were able to show something which I think is of uh, great importance for the future. That is to say that fungi, in addition to activating the system via this molecule which recognizes glucan, can activate the system by cleaving a blood zymogene, so a pro-protease, CN protease, and then uh, leading to the activation of the proteolytic cascade and again uh, to Spätzle cleavage. Now, why is this important? We have known, and it has been known for a long time, that fungi, upon infecting, uh, insects produce chitinases and proteases. Now, all these molecules, I'm speaking here about Bovaria basiana, fungus very well studied, genetics and so on, and uh, the uh, proteases have been identified. Now, uh, what could be shown here, this is uh, work of Dominique Ferrandon, whose picture I'm going to show a little bit later, is that one dedicated zymogene, which we call Persephone, recognizes or reacts with the protease secreted by the fungus. And uh, it's only this protease which, re which reacts, not the other proteases uh, which are present. Now, not only, as you may be aware, what I learned, have learned since, not only does uh, this fungus secrete protease, but upon invasion, most, if not all, bacteria, Fungi and parasites secrete proteases. So, uh, we have, so we have here, in addition, a system uh, which would, you, those proteases then you would call virulence factors in this. So we have here a controlled system for proteases, for virulence factors produced by the pathogens. Now, uh, this is uh, something which uh, has just now appeared. Uh, this was published last year by our group in Cell. It is something which has been opened so far, we, like others, have essentially focused on the recognition of microbial ligands, but you see that there are 
two arms to this system. And then let me finish uh, uh, this slide with uh, uh, identify, uh, with the fact that gram-negative bacteria interact directly with the transmembrane peptidoglycan recognition protein. LC is meaningless, uh, it's, it's not meaningless, but it's not necessary for this afternoon, and then acti activate the IMD pathway. So uh, this can be, I think it's clear enough, but I have, yeah, uh, just to point out that uh, uh, the story of the amidases play a role in down-regulating in the blood the level of the immunogenic peptidoglycan. So, uh, we have here sort of a complete picture, of course not uh, only the way it is shown here, but we, uh, a lot of, uh, is known on the, uh, about the details of all this. But we have a very logical cascade here of activation of toll by an amplification cascade in the blood and activation of uh, uh, IMD, but by a more dedicated transmembrane receptor. And and being that effector genes are uh, induced, and effector genes, again, to uh, make this clear, the prominent effector genes, of course, are antimicrobial peptides in all organisms, not only in the fly, but also in mammals. We produce an enormous amount of uh, peptides. Regular, I mentioned the figure of five gram of uh, defensin on our skin every day. So, uh, to fight uh, as a first-line barrier. So, um, and let me now, I will skip this slide here, and let me now uh, just uh, simply illustrate the interest which uh, this can have in, uh, in a very specific context of uh, medically relevant insects. So what we have learned together now this afternoon is that we have a discrimination system of uh, microorganisms of putative or potential pathogens which in the fly is limited to recognition of the two forms of peptidoglycan, the gram-positive and the gram-negative, plus fungal glucans, one free beta-glucans. Uh, there's no activation by lipopolysaccharides in the fly. It is a central activator uh, together with, with lipotoic acid, lipotoic acid in mammals. But this has not been retained by the fly. So it's peptidoglycan and glucans. We have learned that as a result of uh, the interaction of those microbial ligands with the transmembrane or the circulating receptors, we activate NF-kappa B systems. NF-kappa B then, uh, via those complex cascades, which, as I've pointed out, are highly conserved. Now, as a result, we have uh, gene reprogramming and the uh, synthesis of a large number of antimicrobial peptides, but many, many other molecules also. Of course, uh, number one, uh, well, through microarray analysis, we, have, uh, we know the genes, but very little has been done on the function of those genes. And, uh, but uh, again, what is important is that this system is not limited to drosomycin and diptericin. As I mentioned, about 1,000 genes are pregulated in response to such infection, which is uh, parallel to what you see in the activation of uh, a macrophage, a mammalian macrophage or a neutrophil by uh, lipopolysaccharide, which is also lead to the uh, upregulation of about 1,000 genes. So, uh, to uh, stop this, um, or to end my presentation, I would like to illustrate what we have learned starting from this system of uh, cascades, what we have recently learned in Anopheles, in a mosquito. So in a mosquito, a mosquito is uh, responsible for transmitting the uh, pathogen uh, plasmodium, and, uh, which is uh, the causative agent of malaria. So malaria, as uh, you may know, what, as I learned uh, those last two days, was a major problem in Taiwan. And uh, so what happens here is uh, on the first bite, uh, about uh, 10,000 gametes will be taken up by a mosquito. They will transform to okinids, which will uh, go uh, transverse the midgut, transform then into oocysts. It, it does not really matter. The names do not matter this afternoon. And the result is that the mosquito is able to nearly eradicate uh, the uh, number of uh, parasites. The number goes down very dramatically uh, and can be, in the end, can be only just a few. And some strains succeed in totally eradicating uh, the uh, parasite 
and as a result, they will not transmit any more the disease. So the question, of course, for basic uh, research is how can we explain this in terms of uh, uh, say molecular mechanisms and can we possibly imitate this uh, to get rid of uh, the system? After that, at the sporozoic stage, the number increases dramatically again. Okay. So uh, this is an illustration. This is a slide which was taken, the next two slides taken by a um, Taiwanese doctoral student who came from the laboratory of Chen 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 uh, and who did his PhD with us, actually with Elena Levashina in the laboratory. This is a normal parasite at the moment when it leaves the midgut, and this is a parasite which was killed by the mosquito. And you can have both coexisting uh, in the same midgut, so, uh, which explains that some midguts have nearly no parasites and others are filled with parasites. So what Elena uh, did uh, in the group was uh, trying to knock out a certain number of the genes of the signaling cascades of the toll pathway and the IMD pathway as we had started understanding them in the fly. That was the reason why she joined the laboratory to, uh, to address this question in the mosquito with the tools which had been developed in Drosophila, which was easier at that time to address. This is control midgut. And here shown the parasites, they are GFP labeled, that's why they appear here fluorescent. This is in a wild type. Double-stranded means uh, these experiments were done uh, through RNA interference, that is to say injecting double-stranded. And like Z serves as a control. So this is a controlled injection of double-stranded uh, leg Z. And now what she has done is looking at, uh, f at mosquitoes where she had injected cactus, double-stranded cactus. Now remember, cactus is the molecule which retains NF-kappa-B in the cytoplasm. And the essential transactivator NF-kappa-B is unable to uh, control gene expression because it's retained in the cytoplasm. It doesn't gain access to the nucleus. So this is what she saw. There was no infection. They were all, all the parasites were killed. And you see those uh, dark spots uh, are killed parasites which are, have been uh, mildly melanized. So this, this is something where it's one of the of, uh, results which you get rarely in your life. Uh, this is to say when you manipulate one single gene, you have an absolutely fantastic phenotype. And uh, you cannot dream of a better phenotype than the one that you just eradicate here in the parasite. Now the next question was, what, uh, is it really through its retention of NF-kappa-B that the cactus has this effect? And there are two NF-kappa-B family members in, the mos in mosquito. They go by the name of REL1 and REL2. And as shown here, when Elena uh, knocked out cactus in both experiments, and then concomitantly knocked out one or the other of the NF-kappa-B family members, the result was clear-cut. If she knocked out REL1 concomitantly with cactus, you went back, you rescued the phenotype the wild-type phenotype. This is to say that the cactus effect is mediated through binding to REL1, one of the NF-kappa-B family members, and not the other. So it shows it's a very specific thing. Now, this begs, of course, the last question of this story. Uh, which gene under the control of NF-kappa-B here is the one which is responsible for killing the uh, parasites? And uh, here we had found in uh, Drosophila again, and uh, still work uh, where Lena was associated uh, with uh, Marie Lagu, we had found a complement-like protein, which uh, we called TEP for thioester containing protein. And this thioester is uh, similar to the one, to the function, thioester function, which we find in complement, molecule, complement molecules. And this is a complement you're familiar, I suppose, with complement, C3, C4, C5 complement. Now, uh, this complement protein uh, is produced in the hemocytes and it binds to the surface of the parasites, as shown here, TAP1. So, uh, in other words, uh, the uh, cactus NF kappa B system controls the gene expression of a molecule encoding a complement-like protein, and this complement-like protein, we suppose, is responsible for the killing of the parasite. Now, is this so? There's an additional demonstration to this, 
I have here the structure, but it doesn't show. It didn't show all, uh, this morning, so it's again a computer problem, or it's maybe a problem in our system. So, uh, in this final slide, what I want to show, uh, to provide you the demonstration that, yes, the TAP1, or complement protein, if you wish, is really responsible. Not solely, but it is a central factor of the parasite killing. This is a control. Again, the parasites here, a load of about 50. Now, what I'm going to do, what our people did, uh, is uh, loss of function and gain of function. If uh, and a gain of function, or loss of function, let's start with a loss of function. So loss of function is, again, through double-stranded RNA, they have eliminated all or nearly all the production of this complement-like protein. And you see that the number of parasites now has dramatically increased. Now, what happens if we do the reverse? That is to say, we make a gain of function. That is to say, we introduce additional genes, TAP1 coding genes, and then you see that we have nearly eradicated the transmission if you compare this one to uh, this uh, system. So, in other words, uh, without overplaying this, but this is probably one of the first clear demonstrations of the way a mosquito can find the plasmodium infection in the midgut via a blood cell protein, which is of the complement family and which interacts with the parasite. It binds to the parasite, and there's much more information now available on the way this protein is both produced and maintained in the hemolymph before binding to the parasite. So, uh, the point uh, which I've wanted to make here is that in addition to the antimicrobial peptides, which are conserved among the whole array of organisms which have been analyzed so far, we also have other effector molecules like the complement system. We do not know exactly how it works here, but the complement system is strongly involved here, and as it is in uh, all the vertebrates in various uh, defense aspects. So, also that, so, which means that from recognition to signaling and to effect on molecules, we have conserved this. And I'd like to close with um, uh, a last slide, or last but one slide. This is a recent study from uh, Tom Gilmore in Boston. Uh, this is on the C. anemone nemostella. And uh, this is just uh, gene genome sequencing. But it is to point out, uh, so I have put their data into my system of slides. It's not uh, they, uh, but they, they like it, they, they tell me. So uh, no experiments have been done. But simply that at the level of the C. anemone, you have toll-like receptors, you have this adapter protein with 88, you have the tac one map free kinase, you have NF-kappa B, you have I-kappa B, and uh, many more other molecules. So, in other words here, all those partners which play such an essential role in the mosquito and in the fly and in humans and in mice, they are already present at the level of the C anemone. And being a big, a great believer into evolution, I'll finish with this slide and uh, here pointing just to uh, the phylogeny of NF-kappa B as the central transactivator. And uh, you have to apologize. This is a system, uh, this morning it was correct, uh, so it's a, a computer system. Um, but uh, normally the take home message here is that uh, NF-kappa B now, as we know, is present from sponges to cnidaria to the protostomes, mollusks, worms, insects, and so on, and in all the deuterostomes. And um, so what we can say is that this system, both in terms of gene regulation by the central transactivator, in signaling, which means the way of activating the transactivator, and in recognition of infection, plus in some of the, the effector mechanisms, some, not all, is a very ancient system which appeared maybe a billion years ago. Uh, that is a matter of discussion. And uh, with that, I want to close. I will not speak about antiviral defenses because time is gone. And, uh, but we have understood, we understand a lot now about the antiviral defenses and also their parallels there with the mammals, which I wanted to, but that would have been another seminar. Just to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, so obviously, 
uh, my hair becoming gray or being gray, whatever. I have been working for quite some time in the field, and uh, uh, those are, Charles Cetro has been with me all the time. And so has been uh, Jean-Marc Reichardt, uh, and uh, Dominique Ferrandon joined uh, later. He did his PhD with Nusslan Follard on the developmental system. Jean-Luc Imler does the antiviral work. Elena Levashina, the mosquito work. Uh, Julien Royer has done the PGRP work. Bruno Lemaitre, the toll work. And uh, Dimarc and Bullet have done identification of the antimicrobial peptides. And just for the sake of honesty, I would like uh, to show also that many other groups have joined uh, the uh, study of Drosophila immunity now in the United States and done excellent work, which partly I've integrated into my presentation. And I just would like to point out here the work of uh, uh, Catherine Anderson uh, at Sloan Kettering and uh, then uh, Neil Silverman at uh, MassU. And uh, in Europe, uh, the group of the Swedish colleagues started with Hans Boma. And in Asia, there's uh, Sunji Naturi, is now a curata in. Um, in uh, Sendai, and uh, um, we have to have a certain number of Taiwanese people. We have Xin Hong uh, Xiao now, and I'm sure that after your introduction, there will be many people who want to join Strasbourg, the beautiful city of Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Xie Xie. For your Thank you, Mr. President. You give wonderful and stimulating talk. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Okay, is there any question from the audience? Yes, Sorry, this is a... Sorry, just postdocs in France. Yeah. <laughs> the chair lady... No, 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 no. Sorry. Uh, I, Can I ask you uh, ask? Sure. You look so young there. She's the chair lady of uh, life science, okay. Yes. Her question is tough. Looks like uh, the age of a like student, right? Uh, okay. student, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, actually, uh, it's a wonderful talk. Um, this pretty much summarized a lot of work uh, for us. Um, uh, two major questions. One is um, when we open the textbook or uh, paper, we can see like a macrophage, okay, the signal. If we have LPS bind the toll like receptor 4 and MYD88 go down, of course, NF kappa B is the major pathway. But we also see ERK pathway, P30A, okay, junk, all those kind of involved together. So is this only seeing the mammalian cells or also in Drosophila? No, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So the June kinase pathway I mentioned downstream of the uh, map free kinase TAC1. That is clearly involved here. Oh, okay. June kinase is involved. It is not involved in the control of expression of the antimicrobial peptides, but it's involved in the synthesis of uh, genes encoding pro-apoptotic -apo pro molecules okay. or cytoskeletal proteins, number one. For ERK uh, and P38, uh, there are data. Now, the point is they are present. They seem to move some way or another. The point is that in mutant flies, you have no detectable effect on survival or on the parameters which I have shown here. So what, what does this tell us? It tells us that, uh, yeah, there is an ERK equivalent, there's a P38 equivalent, and uh, actually there's a group in Xiamen, opposite uh, of the Straits, oh, yeah. working on this. Okay. And, uh, but the phenotypes mm -hmm. are very discrete. And uh, so you will explain at least, you will understand at least uh, uh, all the doctoral students will understand that when you look at something, uh, you look at something which, which is obvious for, in the beginning. And then, of course, one day one will have to see what P38 does. Okay. But I wouldn't know, uh, none of the readouts which we have in our hands uh, signals a role in that aspect. Okay. So, uh I think, uh, let me uh, ask more. Uh, so for in the draw, in drosophila, so for this, uh, the tall pathway, okay, so I think there are a lot of molecules involved, right? So in mammalian system, so all those molecules have been, the equivalent to the mammalian have been all found or not yet? Um, in the tall system, the tall system in the fly, there is still, you may remember in my slide, there's still a part between the kinase pella, uh -huh. which somehow would be evocative of the kinase irec. Okay. Okay. There's only one pella, okay. there are four irecs. And uh, so uh, downstream, then going from there to the phosphorylation of cactus, 
there is still uh, a gap. We don't understand that. Okay. Now, in addition to that, what I uh, did not mention, that what we are uh, looking at now is uh, there is an active ubiquitination process. Right. Okay. See? And so what, what is very likely in the system is that everything happens at the cytoplasmic membrane. Uh -huh. So as a result of ubiquitination, everything is drawn up to the cytoplasmic membrane, and then only probably the transactivator NF-kappa B and the freed form goes into the nucleus, but... Okay. Can I have last one more? Please. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay, so, Professor. Uh, oh, uh, very good talk. I enjoy it. Thank you. I have two you. short questions. First of all, have you tried to generate two double mutants of TOR and MMD what is the phenotype you, you did? Yes, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is one of the, I would say, one of the basic tools in the laboratory is a double mutant, as you would have the uh, mid-88 TRIF double mutant. So that is, uh, um, I would say the, the phenomenon, uh, if that is your question, is additive. That's to say you take away the defense to all microorganisms. That is um, the most striking and expected phenotype. But there's nothing really striking beyond that. So you block this. Very good. In the second question, uh, do you know why bacteria or fungi release factors which eventually no good to them? Which eventually, excuse no me? No good to the bacteria, to yeah. the fungi. Why? Why do they do this kind of suicide yeah. way? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, uh, I mean, uh, this is, uh, I understand your question, I agree with it, but it's one of those general questions where there's no real answer to it. Uh, you might have expected that, okay, for one reason or another, because it is uh, not positive for the fungus to activate uh, the pathway. So this is the eternal arms race between uh, uh, the United States and Russia, you see, for instance. Uh, you do something, uh, of course, uh, the fungus cannot uh, not produce a protease because it helps him or helps it invade the fly. So the prote it has to produce a protease. Now at a given moment, uh, naively we could say, okay, uh, Drosophila then has uh, decided to put there uh, a zymogen which is going to react and activate the toll pathway. So then you could, uh, you could say, well, maybe then there will be uh, a coevolution and uh, uh, at a given moment, Persephone will not recognize the protease anymore. I don't know. I, I have no answer to it. I think I believe, believe no one has an answer to Is it. Is it possible that the target cells design a way to protect themselves? You know, yes. you know I see you uh, bacteria, I see you fungus, and you need some kind of factor, and then I produce or express some kind of receptor to be the, uh, to be the receptor for the ligand from the bacteria. Yes, it's possible, yes, you're right, it's something like that. This is the arms race uh, between the pathogens and the hosts, and which um, attracts much interest, but uh, I have no answer to it. Okay. Any questions from the students? Any other questions? So then I would say that I leave um, the, uh, well, if you look on PubMed, you will find the reviews. I hope that a few of you are interested and the system and this and the, you have seen there's a lot to do and uh, so what is a new really the new perspective now inflammation i had no time to go into this and uh, this is parallel to the T tnf uh, system so uh, this is not propaganda i'm not making okay. propaganda. i'm just saying i give you uh, one the, minute to, to, for propaganda no so problem. the papers <laughs> you started the propaganda for space. that's right that's right so uh, the papers give all the detail of this you can look through that and if you have any question uh, my colleagues here have all indications to, to get in touch with me and we'll be happy to, to help you and to, uh, to work with you. Okay, please show me to thank uh, President uh, Hoffman. Okay.